Wow. What a day. What a crazy day. It's time for one of our, well, there's, good, there's one more at the end of this, but uh, it's time for our last panel and one of our last collective scratch and sniffs. Um, hold, hold on a minute. Um, this is ridiculous. One of our last, uh, one of our last sniffs. Um, hold on a second. Uh, anybody who has a card, if you want to hold it up, I want to take a, let me take a picture of you holding up your scratch and sniff card. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so it's time, as we welcome uh, Michael Alargo, it's time to scratch uh, panel number three. Anybody want to tell me what on earth they are? Oh, Michael, all right. It's time for panel number three. Oh! oh. What do you scratch it with? Nail. Really? Oh my lord, I'm gonna get a penny. Well, there you go, a penny, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody want to say what on earth that smell is? Oh, guess is in the chat. Gasoline. No, yeah, no, Mark's got it. Tire. Apparently the smell is offensive. Yes, Caroline, it is. Burnt Band-Aid. Wow. Rubber Cologne. Burnt rubber. Rubber Cologne. Yeah, there we go. See what happens when you're an entrepreneur. Um, it, it is a very strange fume. It's very, yes, it's a very strange fume. But Martin, since you wouldn't give me my own fume, I decided to come prepared wearing it. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't give me locker room, you wouldn't give me armpits, you wouldn't give me jock straps. So if you want to come and sniff the jock strap, you can fucking do that. Well, <laughs> Hon, I'm pandemic, you know, I'm, I have a mask on, everything, hon. I love that. Strange fume. It sounds Strange like fumes. A, it's a psychic TV album. I wouldn't be a fucking good gay if I didn't have a jockstrap in my closet. It's the only <laughs> thing that's ever been in the closet. <laughs> Certainly not me. So, um, for those of you um, wondering, I, I did ask Michael, um, hey, what smell do you want? Which then, I think we had a week of like, it didn't occur to me that I would need to explain why I was asking that. But, but of course, uh, it's insane. So I, I explained it. Um, Michael immediately got the um, uh, John Waters uh, connection. Uh, did Michael just disappear? Oh, right here with my John Waters card. Wow. Oh, well, all right. I went through so many fucking boxes tonight. Archival boxes. Wow. Anyway, uh, you asked me to come here, and uh, I can't believe that whatever company made this didn't have at least an armpit smell. Well, they don't. Well, <laughs> first I, of all, I, I made it with my two. Uh, with my two youngest boys. Oh, ouch. Uh, yeah, but, which was a wonderful experience because one of the smells, uh, number two is weed, which I think they did a pretty good job on the weed. Um, uh, but they sent me a number of smells. I did say, do you have like a sweaty, a sea salt, sweaty vibe? No. Um, uh, do you? Ha I think you asked me for sweaty boys in a mosh pit was your first request, Michael. Oh, really? No, that's what you thought I asked you, but it sounds good. All I think I asked for was like a boys' locker room, jock straps, and armpits. Okay. And, and, you, ga and you gave me none of that, so I came prepared. Okay. FYI. Thank you. And, but they Welcome. Sent me, like, they sent me like Swiss cheese. Ugh. Uh, garlic. It, 
and honestly, no. it was like it was like I was being punished. Um, well, uh, so welcome, uh, Michael. It's really nice um, <laughs> to, to have you here. Uh, at the end. I'll, I'll take off my jock strap now, and you can you can take that any way you like. <laughs> Oh, um, oh! It was so sweaty in there, honey. <laughs> uh, somebody just asked in the chat if if you if that if the John Waters card still smells. Oh well, you know what? I will let me do uh, what number? One through ten. Pick a number. Seven. Okay. Oh, it sounds scratchy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's um. It's a fume, very strange. I'm sorry I can't tell you, but it almost made me cough badly. And it's definitely some kind of fume. Okay. Well, so, um, uh, well, oh. it's, it's fun to be in, uh, to, to be in the same uh, area as John Waters, for sure. Oh, honey, yeah, for sure. So, um, w uh, welcome, Michael. It's so it's been an emotional day. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my friend Ad Two was on a panel around about one or two o'clock, speaking about his mentees. Uh, he has a place called the Haven Studio. Okay. We talked about redefining success. Uh, some people who aren't around anymore, um, and uh, it's it's been one of somewhat reflection of <laughs> where we are. Um, sure. So this is a, a kind of a wonderful, um, a wonderful end to a day that really began on Thursday evening, really, um, uh, as we watch your, your documentary. Um, so let, let me introduce you properly to everyone. You are, um, uh, you've been in the music business since an early age, um, sneaking out to concerts at the age of what, 15 or 16? Sure, yes. Uh, an assistant to, was it Jerry Brandt at the Ritz? Yes, my first job at, uh, in the music business was in, uh, started in 1980 when I uh, walked into the Ritz, uh, which was a nightclub on East 11th Street. Uh, uh, in in, in, in uh, more modern days, people know that venue as Webster Hall. Uh, I was 19 years old. I was going to the School of Visual Arts and uh, it was, it's a beautiful Art Deco building from the 20s. And um, remember, it's 1980, it's the advent of MTV. This club was opening, it was, uh, it was a video club. And uh, I asked for a job. And uh, Jerry said, well, do you have a resume? And I looked at him, because I had no, I really, kid from Brooklyn, I really didn't have any idea what a resume was. And he thought that was funny. So he called me up to his office, even though you didn't ask me all this, Martin, but I'm, I'm on fire today, uh, as you can tell. Um, so he uh, called me up to his office and um, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, I want to be in the music business. He said, do you play anything? I said, no, but I go out every single night. And we started talking about music all kinds of music, from the Great American Songbook in the 1930s to present day and what was going on in the New York underground scene. He said, I like you. I'm gonna give you a job here at the Ritz. You're gonna answer my phone, you're gonna go get my lunch, and you're gonna open my mail. And I was in heaven because when, from Bro this is a kid, young kid from Brooklyn who always said, I'm gonna be in the music business. And I had no plan B. And I was 19 years old, and this was the beginning. So, our well, our paths, our paths. You you booked um, Public Image Limited at the Ritz when Bow Wow Wow canceled. Sure, yes. And although I was connected with PIL at the time, I was in my flat in London, Wilsdon Green, London. My phone starts ringing off the hook. See you in a couple of, I'm like, uh, uh, and the PIL performed at the Ritz without really performing. Yes, do you want me to just tell you a, a short version of the story? 
Yeah, and then I, I want I, I, I yeah, okay. So I became the assistant booking director at the Ritz, and I started there uh, when the Ritz opened sometime in early 1980. Fast forward to uh, May of 1981. I have two sold out shows with Bow Wow Wow on a Friday and Saturday in May. And um, at one point during the week, Malcolm McLaren called me up and he said, We're not coming. I said, What do you talk? What are you talking about? You're not coming. He said, Well, you know, Annabelle's mother won't let her go to the States because she's underage. And I said, well, Malcolm, you booked this two months ago and she was still underage. So what are you talking about? And we're sold out. And I said, well, you know what? We'll pay for her mom to come, ma to come here with her. And he said, well, we're not coming. I said, well, send back the 50% deposit. And of course, knowing Malcolm McLaren, I don't remember him sending back the 50% deposit. I don't remember how I knew Pill were in town. They were at Liz Rosenberg's office at Warner Brothers Records uh, doing a press junket for the Flowers of Romance. They were not here to perform. I, I don't know how, like I said, I don't know how I knew they were there. I called Liz Rosenberg's office. I introduced myself because I've never had a problem introducing myself. Um, and uh, I said, please put me on speakerphone. I talked to John, Jeanette, and Keith. Uh, and so they had some videographer with them to come down to my office at the Ritz. They came down to my office. I explained what I needed. They explained what they wanted to do because they knew we had a 30 by 30 foot white screen. That was like the talk of the town because we presented videos there. Uh, the evening comes. We bought Keith like I think a Prophet 5 synthesizer so he could program like 45 minutes worth of music in there. They stay behind the screen. These white lights are glaring at the screen and you see these beautiful black shadows dancing behind the screen. You think kids came here to see performance art? No, they wanted to see Johnny Rotten in action. So all he did, what Flowers of Romance starts playing, he peeks his head out uh, and he says, we're never coming out from behind the screen. Well, you never saw tables, chairs, and beer bottles get thrown at that ex very expensive uh, screen faster than I don't know what. It, it was a, a full-scale riot. Um, we had to, you know, security had to start letting people out. It was a sold-out event, uh, even for Pill, even with only a th three days' notice. Uh, there was probably over 3,000 people there. Um, when we got everybody out, uh, I went into the dressing room. We all laughed our heads off because we thought it was funny, and we continued to drink and do other things, and uh, I wanted them to come back the next day. Security, uh -huh. security wanted to kick my ass. Jerry Brandt, my boss, said, well, what do we do in tomorrow? I said, bring them back. Very infamous. The next morning, that night, it was on the 11 o'clock news, or the one o'clock in the morning news. The next morning, it was on the cover of Sounds, Melody Maker. Give me the third Mac publication. NME? The NME, all in the UK. It was a shot heard around the world. Um, so I, I, I have seen footage from behind the screen. Ah. And it's hilarious. First off, um, uh, he recently died, but Keith went up to uh, a, a music shop, 58th and something, and asked Sam Ulano, the guy behind the counter, a jazz drummer. Yes. Come and, come and play, which I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and so Sam is sat behind the kit. And I'm listening, I'm just grabbing my water. Okay. Um, and uh, I see the camera behind the screen on the stage side of it, pans over and you see Keith playing the Prophet synthesizer. I think they had uh, a, an album on the turntable. And Keith yes. Sam hit it. Well, if it was me, it would, you know, whatever. But Sam was a jazz drummer. And so Sam starts skidding, bam, ba, 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 you know, and then the record skipped. And that's, that's when people realized that it, they weren't hearing real music. One thing that happened with the with the videographer behind the stage i saw the footage once i think most people were infatuated with jeanette lee uh, uh -huh. she was on the front cover of the flowers of romance album sure 
he was wearing a short plaid skirt and those shiny black patent uh, shoes. Patent leather, yes. That, that, uh, that nuns would tell schoolgirls not to wear because you could see a reflection in the shoe up the skirt. And so with all the mayhem going on on the screen, this camera keeps going down away from John, away from the mayhem and focusing on Jeanette's uh, shoes. Just a different side of the mayhem. Different the perspective, yes, yes. Um, so uh, who else were you booking at the Ritz? I, I, everybody. Oh, you know, you know it, 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 the Ritz also was a place that was the talk of the town. So um, because we had to fill uh, a 1,500, 1,600 seat venue most of the time, of course, uh, we had all types of people playing there. We had uh, five nights of the return of Tina Turner. We had uh, two nights of Prince when his uh, first Dirty Mind album came out, uh, Kid Creole and the Coconuts. Um, everybody who was uh, on the charts, basically, in the 80s was playing at the Ritz. And uh, when, if it was a Monday or Tuesday night, we do like a, a video night for $2.50 and we would show movies. I always wanted to show like Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble, Multiple Maniacs, the Diane Linkletter story. Um, so I, what everybody thought were off nights, I would do these like, uh, you know, uh, underground films that we would show. And I did that for three years from 1980 to 1983. And then I got my first job as an a &R executive. And I didn't even know what a &R meant when I got the fucking job. So how, I'm, I'm sure any students uh, in the session will be like, how did you get that job? How does one get that job? Oh boy. Um, I've never been shy. Uh, I knew I always wanted to be in the music business. I feel like I had a bit of good luck. Um, when I was leaving the Ritz, I was going out with somebody named Mitchell Krasnow. His dad was leaving Warner Brothers. And he said, uh, you know, Michael, my dad is going to revamp Electra because it was in the crapper, excuse me. And uh, I said, yeah. He said, I think you should meet my dad. And I said, great. And I said to Jerry Brandt, my boss, I said, you know, Jerry, I've loved it here, but I know there's more out there for me. He said, well, I don't want to lose you, but I'm friends with Bob. Bob Krasnow has been a colleague of mine for 30 years. I will tell him about you. So these different voices were peppering Bob Krasnow, the new chairman's ear. And I had that same conversation with Bob that I had with Jerry. We talked about music. We talked about all kinds of music. Keep in mind, it's New York City. It's 1983. All the East Village gal galleries are starting to open. Fun, uh, the fun gallery that Patty Astor had, Civilian Warfare, Gracie Mansion. We're seeing artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Robert Long. Uh, 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 Richard Hambleton, who was famous for those sha black shadow men happening. And Bob was an art lover. So never mind that Bob and I talked about all kinds of music. We talked about art as well. Um, and he said, I'll give you a call in two weeks. And in two weeks, he said, I'm setting up the a and department. I'm giving you a job. I think I cried on the phone. Uh, I was now going to work for Electra Records. So of course, I had to call all my friends and say, what does A&R mean? Yeah. And they all laughed in my face, as I'm sure some of your uh, participants and panelists are. And I guess everybody is shy here because I don't see any of our 16 panelists' live faces, except maybe Mark Smith. Is that, are you moving, Mark Smith? Ah, even Mark Smith is not moving. Okay, whatever. Oh, I smell like fumes. Okay, so uh, I, I get this job and I am a sponge and I am a quick study and I, uh, it was on the job training. Mm -hmm. I, I can't explain it any other way than that. And I was an A&R executive at Electra at Geffen, then I went back to Electra, then I went back to Geffen, and then I was at Palm Pictures and that's 25 years right there. So that's the nutshell version. I, did you did you did you take Metallica to Electra with you, or 
did you find and sign Metallica as a new A&R person? Well, they were the second band I signed. It's uh, um, uh, at some point, Johnny Z, who ran a small label called Megaforce. He, he signed Metallica and made their first record, Kill Em All. He signed Anthrax and Raven and made their first albums. But being a very small independent label in New Jersey, all they could do was make the records. They had no funds to take these artists to those next steps. Um, John and I became colleagues very quickly. He wanted me to sign Raven because uh, he thought they were going to be the biggest band in the whole world. So it's 1983. I gave him $5,000. I said, give me your five best songs. They, uh, they give me five songs. They were terrific. The problem was I heard Kill Em All. I had already seen Metallica twice, once at Lemoore, once at the Stone in San Francisco. Uh, and when I Saw them at the Stone in San Francisco. I gave Lars my card. I mean, I never looked like this. I look like this all the time. So back then, I, I certainly didn't look like a record executive. I probably had a Misfits or a Plasmatics t-shirt on. And he said, uh, you're an a person at Time Warner at Electra Records. I said, yes. So fast forward, I let John Zazula know I don't want to sign. Um, Raven, I wanted to sign Metallica. That phone conversation did not go well at all. Um, but he knew that we both had our best interests for Metallica, but I could do on a grand scale because I worked for a major corporation, what he couldn't do. So his business, in a nutshell, his business affairs, talked to our business affairs, and everybody walked away satisfied. All of that occurred around August of 1984, when Metallica were part of a triple act bill at the Roseland Ballroom on West 52nd Street in New York City. They were the middle act, and uh, I talk about this in my documentary, Who the Fuck Is That Guy? The Fabulous Journey of Michael Lago. Huh. And, um, I go backstage, they all look at me like I'm crazy. I'm a little more than tipsy. So I'm hugging everybody and kissing everybody. And Lars like says to James, you know, this is Michael Alago from Electra. And they all stopped what they were doing and they're like, they're looking at me like, this is the guy we're entrusting our lives with. And I was like, yes, that's me. And you know what? The rest is history. That's the short version. Okay, so. <sighs> yes. As, as a, no, the, the, yeah. So, um, <laughs> after Metallica comes who? Oh, well, I was on a bit of a heavy metal roll. Um, so after Metallica, I signed Metal Church and Flotsam and Jetsam, and, and then uh, Dawkins, a and person, left Electra. So I had to, by default, oh, become um, Dawkins, a and person. Uh, at some point, you know, Bob knew that I was someone who could handle all styles of music. So at one point he called me into his office. He said, I signed a young lady from Boston. Her name is Tracy Chapman and you are her A&R person. Uh, she had started her record already with David Kirschenbaum. So I would just pop into the studio to hear what the track sounded like. I was there for the mixing. I mastered the album and I was really uh, 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 instrumental in putting that packaging together of her in that sepia toned uh, picture with her head, um, tilted to the right, and it's a very quiet, atmospheric picture, um, and it, uh, it felt like the album. Um, at some point in 1985, I hooked up with John Lydon again, and I signed him to make a record. He made a record called Album with Bill Laswell. Hold that thought one minute. It just happens to be right here, just by Kawinki JP. Do you have the reissue? No, is there a reissue? Yeah, there's a reissue. Okay, no. Anyway, so this was the album that we made at Electra, And, uh, you know, the campaign was album, cassette, poster, you know, blah, blah, CD. Genius. Well, you know, generic. It looked like, uh, you know, the cornflakes box or something like that. Um, the record was fabulous. There were all session musicians on it. Um, I knew that John had these two records that Virgin were not putting out in the U US and Canada, uh, live in Tokyo, and this is what you want, this is what you get. So I picked them up for the States. Uh, about a year and a half passed and the records really aren't selling and he had a major, major deal. And the powers that be in corporate 
said it just wasn't uh, it just wasn't cost effective to keep him. Now keep in mind, and I'll end right here. Um, I know John forty years now, and we've never had a bad word with each other. Believe yeah. you me. And um, I, you know, I had I had five years in that uh, in that band, and um, it's it's sad to me that um, you know John and I were like brothers at one point. You know, we made a few albums together and toured the world and went through a bunch of, of ups and downs. Sure. But it's it's tough, you know, I to leave a band, it's I think it's I, I don't I don't imagine it can be ever ever be seen as anything less than a betrayal. You know, I, I that's fair enough. Um so uh I, you make no secret of it in the documentary, uh, nor nor in your book. That you, and I think um, the guys in Metallica said in the documentary, you were one of those people who were just drinking everything um, and uh, doing any any drugs in sight. Basically, I I think that would be that would be fair to say of of many of us back then. Sure, you know it was the eighties. It was the music business. I had a corporate business card. And you know, it was my job to go out every night and see artists and entertain lawyers and publishers and uh, musicians. And it just really, it became out of hand. And it, uh, I became a, uh, a, a stone cold alcoholic. At some point, you know, I loved ecstasy and cocaine. Uh, then crack came into the picture and I was an absolute mess. It's, it's wild that I never got fired from any of my jobs. I always, I, well, the two jobs that I had for a long period of time, I went to work every day. Not to say that I was in tip top condition at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I just left the door to my office closed till three in the afternoon, till everything lifted. Uh, but yes, I was a mess for a very long time. And never mind in um, 83, 84, I found out I had contracted HIV and, um, in the, in the gay community, when people heard that they had contracted HIV, it was a death sentence. There was no medications for HIV. I, I wound up staying, believe it or not, asymptomatic for six or seven years. So my doctor just monitored me all the time and uh, I still drank. I didn't pay attention that all of that could kill me. Um, I mean, it becomes a long story. So I'll just tell you, at 32 years old, I went to rehab. I didn't fucking want to go, but I didn't want to lose my job. It was the job that I treasured so much, and I wound up spitting all over it uh, because I was an alcoholic. I did my 30 days at Hazleton. I came out, I went back to work, and I stayed what they called a dry drunk. For those of you who don't know, or for maybe for those of you who are in a 12-step program, dry is when you um, don't drink, but you're not in any program. Uh, you don't do anything to help yourself. So I was still a jerk. I was still rude and an asshole. And um, I stayed that way for eight years. Uh, now I'm 40 years old and I'll wrap this up. I'm 40 years old and uh, someone said to me at a concert, do you want to drink? I started drinking again for the next seven years. I wound up in jail. I wound up in um, crack dens in New Orleans. And I wound up in, uh, our local St. Vincent's Hospital many a time, thinking that my heart was gonna stop. At 47 years old, everything was hurting. And my doctor said, you know what? You can't continue doing this. And I just uh, went, I'm done. And I started a 12-step program uh, 13 years ago. I'm 61 years old now, and uh, I don't drink or drug no matter what. I show up for life. I'm a responsible human being. If you tell me I want you to be somewhere, I will be there. And uh, you know, my life, it's a new life from, I mean, I loved my old life, parts of it. I, I, I don't know where I'm going. Anyway, so yeah, so I don't drink or drug no matter what. And thank God, uh, I, I talk about it in my book and it's too long to discuss here. At some point there was medication I started taking. Right now, the virus is zero in my body, which is a fucking miracle because all the gay men and women that I knew in the 80s were all dead. So it's a, really a miracle that I survived all this, but I think it's because, uh, you know, I have faith and I believe in God and the universe and uh, I'm supposed to be here, so. And, and 
I appreciate you. I, aside from uh, um, uh, having to go at me about the availability of scratch and sniff smells, in the middle of that conversation, you know, I, I, have, I had 16 years sober and I, I began drinking um, ah, okay. when, when my dad died. Mm -hmm. and, and that conversation, we, we were just in a conversation and the conversation stopped and changed immediately. And I felt your concern, um, and I very much appreciate that. Um, uh, it was kind of, uh, it's, it stayed with me uh, okay. for, for a while, and I, and I appreciate that. Oh, well, absolutely, my pleasure. That is uh, what it's all about when you're in a program. It's to be of service to others. And that's like life itself. You, you're here to be kind. Uh, it's, it could be, kindness is the domino effect. And, you know, if you think that sounds corny, so be it. But I am kind. I tell the truth because if I do that, really, the next person is going to do that. And it all winds up helping to make really the world become a better place one of these days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, now, honey, were people asking us questions in this thing on the right? Yeah, there's, there's a couple oh. of things. There's a okay. Q there's, um, yeah. That, well, we'll, we'll get, oh. get to some questions. In Sorry. The no, that's fine. I, I don't want to hijack this yet. <laughs> no, no. Um, I wanted to, we talked about the documentary. I did want to mention your book. Um, sure. The, the, the documentary is, but, 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 it's really well made. Uh, there's, a, there's definitely a, a vibe and an energy to it. Oh, sure. There is a much more still calm. Mm -hmm. this book which I've really been appreciating well um, you know you're reading a book and you don't catch my energy it's not an audio book so you're reading stories about artists and about New York City and about alcoholism and recovery and AIDS and gratitude and my mom and um, so it definitely has a different tone and it's all oh, me and my mom Brooklyn 1960 <laughs> I was always dressed up like that, too. But yes, there's a certain rhythm in the documentary because I'm like a train going crazy, and I'm always energetic. And then you put Cindy Lauper and James Hetfield and John Lydon and Phil Anselmo from Pantera in there, and it just amps the whole documentary up in a fantastic way. Well, I thought... And yes, that's my book over there, wherever you were showing it. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's called, I, I just, you know, I have to do this and be a little shameless. It's called I Am Michael Alago, Breathing Music, Signing Metallica, Beating Death, and you can get it for $20, I'm cheap, on Amazon.com. And it's, it's in the, there's a link in the chat already. Ah, wonderful, thank you. It struck me, you know, that yeah, please. The, the Nina Simone chapter Mm -hmm. felt like almost a movie in itself. Yeah, it's probably about 22 pages well, in what, the book. What a, what a, uh, <clears throat> so she was obviously troubled. I think you described her or other people had described her as just completely impossible. Sure. Um, um, what, what, why, why, why would you accept that challenge? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, uh, I realized early on in my a and career, I only wanted to deal with greatness. And I felt that I knew what greatness was all about. I had heard Nina's voice at a very young age at my dad's sister, my Aunt Jenny's home. She would be playing uh, Isaac Hayes, uh, uh, Curtis Mayfield, Johnny Mathis, Nina Simone. And that voice just stuck with me at 13 years old. And um, when I started buying vinyl, I bought a bunch of her records. Uh, fast forward, she is my all-time favorite artist. I don't think there's anybody greater than her on the planet. If, you know, when they, people would joke around and they say, well, you're on a desert island, and what five records would you bring? I would probably only bring Nina Simone records, and I would be the happiest camper in the whole wide world. She was a tough cookie to deal with. She was troubled. Um, she was bipolar. Uh, she drank with her medication, the 
same way I did, but she would, you know, and you can't toss this word that I'm about to say around too often because it just dilutes it. But she really was a genius. She was genius. She was part of the civil rights movement in the 60s. She marched with Dr. King. She wrote a song uh, in, in the 60s called Mississippi Goddamn. And it's a fantastic anthem to the civil rights movement. Fast forward, she made lots of records for Phillips and RCA. You know, she was a person who knew how to interpret other people's songs. So when she, she did Here Comes the Sun by George Harrison, when she, uh, 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 reinterpreted uh, Jacques Brel, No Me Quita Pa, uh, when she um, sang Bob Dylan, Just Like a Woman, and Just Like Tom Thumb's Blues, you would think, if you didn't know those other artists, that she wrote that material because she got to the heart of the matter and made it something stupendous. I, I didn't have a better word than that, but that's an okay word. Um, so I, none of that bothered me. I loved the whole idea that she was trouble and uh, I ate it all up. We stayed friends for the last 15 years of her life. She loved me because I was way younger than her and she knew of the great love and respect that I had for her. We made one album with a 50 piece orchestra called The Single Woman in 1993. And 10 years later, in 2003, she passed away. It, it um, that, that, I mean, the whole book is, uh, uh, lays, lays a lot bare. Sure. The communication between you and Nina, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, I, was, I think it was the New York Times that said, Yes, it was a large, a very big article that James Gavin in the New York Times wrote. I, I'm listening, but I want to just find something for you again. Uh, did did was it the Times that said that she was the she was the only thing standing in her own way, or or somebody? Yeah, something. I mean, it's paraphrasing, but basically, she was always the only one standing in her own way, and that was because of just a lot of, you know, failed marriages, uh, failed marriages, and um, like I just said, bipolar, alcoholism. You know, in the later parts of her life, she had breast cancer, she she had strokes, and you know, nothing was the same. But I just loved her so much, so much. The the scene, there's a scene. Uh, on the Tonight Show, which sounds like a nightmare. It um, was. Wanted to get paid. But then there's a scene where you, I don't, was it the same weekend where there's a bunch of people in her room and she's like, everybody out, and you get in the bathtub, in a bubble bath with her. Sure, it's a fun story in the book. Um, it's July 1999. Nick Cave from the birthday party is doing a series of concerts called uh, the Meltdown series. So, you know, it was Elvis Costello one night, the Bad Seeds one night, Suicide another night, and Nina Simone. Um, and uh, so I go to her hotel with two dozen white roses and a bottle of champagne. She sees me, she was getting her hair cornrowed, and she says, everybody out. She and you know, she called me sugar lips. <laughs> and she's on oh, my sugar lips. And I said, honey, I'm here. She said, you know what? Let's take a bubble bath. As you do. With a legend. Uh, and I was like, uh, okay. So I went in the, in, the, in the bathroom to see if there were bubbles. I had to call concierge. I said, could you call the chemist, which is what they call them in the UK. Can you call the chemist and get me bubbles? got the bubbles, she thought nothing is stripping down. I left my box of shorts on. We brought the champagne into the bubble, into the bathtub, and we laughed like teenagers. And unfortunately, uh, let's see, 99, yeah, that was the last time I saw her in person. But what a way to go. All those other times, I was mostly in New York, and she was in the south of France. Well, I just, um... It, I don't know, it seemed, maybe you, uh, I've worked with some people as well who have that cycle. Um, and I, I certainly, uh, I'd, I'd loved reading that. I'm, I'm enjoying the book a lot. Oh, good. And for those of you who don't have the book yet, here's a great picture of me and Nina. Oh, wow. Wow. 
And uh, I have to say something to Tanya here. Tanya, I'd love to write a book about Nina Simone too. But if you Google, Google, yeah, Michael Alago on YouTube, there's a, recently, there's a whole bunch of um, interviews where I talk about, or the title is, you know, Alago takes a, a bubble bath with a legend. And of course it's Nina Simone. So. I, I wanna, I wanna do like, I think that should be your, your uh, cable access show, uh, your new Zoom show. Uh, like David Letterman has, and my next guest is. Oh yes. You could have Michael Alago takes a bubble bath with Dr. Oh, that would be cute. I can get all the hottest dudes in the world. Most of them are straight that I like, but that has never stopped me in my 61 years. Woo! Having a ball. Okay. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a couple of questions, Molly says, in the what? Okay. In the Q&A. Um, oh, I guess the Q&A, hon, is different than the chat? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, what were the factors that determined whether you signed bands and or artists? Yeah, sure. Um, like I said, I felt in my heart, I was a really good A&R person and that has nothing to do with ego. It's about like the job that I always wanted. I knew what good was and I felt I knew what great was. And like I said, I'm only signing great. Great to me is somebody who is charming and charismatic and knew, knows how to work an audience. And, 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 and when you have all of that, the audience responds to you. Uh, uh, w w somebody who tells a great story, whether it's James Hetfield and Metallica telling his great story or Tracy Chapman talking about, uh, talking about a revolution or a fast car. Um, I loved artists who, uh, 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 like I said, who are, are, are that charismatic. And I felt like I knew who had that it factor. And it's a thing that you cannot buy. Rob Zombie has it in spades. You know, uh, uh, that charm, that charisma. Um, you can't buy that kind of stuff. So I guess great storytelling, being that charismatic, having great material, those are the factors that determine whether I was signing somebody or not. And I, th I think Rob Zombie said himself in the documentary that they only basically had, they felt they had like one good riff. He I said, Michael only hurt, Michael kept talking about this one damn riff that we had. And I think he signed us based on that riff. And I did because I saw and heard the possibilities. I mean, it was really primal, and it was noise, and it was not really songs. I didn't care. I knew I could do something with them, and I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, Abby asked a, a, a pretty interesting question in the chat, uh -oh. which, which leads us to the next part of this. Um, were there, were there um, everybody will be jumping in the tub, yes. Um, oh, sure, honey. Are there any skills you learned in the music industry that translated well to photography? Oh, I hate to say this, but not really. Um, uh, we can backtrack just for a minute. I always loved pictures. I was a nerdy kid. If I went to other people's homes, I always wanted to see what their family photo albums looked like. I loved that pictures told stories. So I knew at some point in time, I used to carry my Polaroid camera around with me. I used to have a little yellow plastic uh, Kodak Instamatic that I could fit in my pocket. I knew I wanted to tell stories. I didn't know what kind of stories I wanted to tell, but when I was out every night at rock and roll venues, whether I was snapping pictures of Alan Vega, Cherry Vanilla, Deborah Harry, Patti Smith, or, uh, 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 or, or as, as the years went by, I Polaroided a lot of men that I picked up on the street, uh, whether that was in Paris, in, in, in LA, in New York, and, and that kind of became my life, Polaroiding men. Um, and I, I, th that's just what I knew I wanted to do. So at some point, I, um, a publisher saw my work and I made three books of like male erotica. Um, so it didn't really, the music business thing didn't really transfer over except that I always was a visual artist 
at an early age. I just didn't really know that yet. I didn't know what my focus was going to be. I am working on a black and white book right now that, uh, oh, wait, this is cool. I'm um, working on a black and white book right now that has nothing to do with male erotica. I shoot everything on the iPhone with a hip, with an application called Hipstamatic. And I found this black and white app that I friggin' love. And I'm working on, um, 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 what am I working on? I am working on uh, portraits called Art in the Time of Coronavirus. And here I could show you like a little bit what they look like. We could do, I don't know if we could do this properly. It might not look so good. It looks, well, they look like they will, they will, they are good. If that makes sense. Yeah, uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. And, you know, everything is a square. That's how they come out of the camera. I love squares. Uh, I, I, I love how I, um, I always like to fill that square with the person's personality. So that's what I'm working on right now as well. Hmm. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about. Okay. They, quick. <laughs> no, go ahead, please, Martin. Um, so you've been in New York my all, whole life. Your whole life. Yes, and sir. when I go back um, to the places that I'm familiar with, the Iroquois Hotel off of Times Square, the loft on 19th Street and 11th, the change just boggles my mind. Um, I have students or graduates ask me i'm going to new york to try and make it i'm like ah i, I just wanted to get your take on how the city has changed how it is changing what it is now you know uh, like I said, I've lived in New York my whole life. I've been, I'm 61 years old. I've been going out since I'm 15 years old. Um, I, uh, in the last 15, 20 years, the city has been totally gentrified. All of the things that we loved from the 80s and the 90s, most, I'm sure 90, 9% of them do not exist anymore. It is a very expensive city. It's a marvelous city still. Prior to the pandemic, you know, I was out at the theater all the time. There were concerts in big halls and small venues and, and bars. Uh, 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 in recent years, something called the High Line um, uh, opened up as a park. What the High Line is, is that along the West Side Highway, it was an old rail, it was like an above uh, the ground uh, railroad station, and now it's a magnificent park. So there's so many different things that if you haven't been here, Martin, in 10 years, I don't even know where to begin, you know? And, uh, but it's a marvelous city. It's just very different and very expensive. And um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's it. The, the people I still know from yes. there. Yes, please. Margot from the Go-Go's. She's oh He's still down on 11th between A and B. Oh, nice. He moved into that place when it was a squat that the Hells Angels came back from Vietnam and squatted that building. Wow. Bought it off of the city. Um, anybody else who, who didn't look into something like that, um, they're living two hours outside of the city now. Yes. You yes. Know, still, still magnetized by it, still want to be close to it, but um can't afford it i bet yeah 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 um so if you were advising somebody uh oh um sure who that's about to enter into photography or the music business what what would you say to them well the photography and the music business might be two different things you know but but you know Always, I ha always had this go get it, go get them approach to things. I think if you believe in yourself, whether that's a, I don't know whether you're a musician or a photographer, you just have to go, you have to do everything from the gut. You have to trust yourself. You have to, you know, when people said, 
oh, wait, you're going to shoot male erotica? Like, why would you do that? Don't you want to shoot heavy metal bands? No, I had 25 years worth of heavy metal bands. I want to shoot what I want to shoot. And that was men who were scarred and tattooed. And you know what? Because I did that, it was something I believed in. The pictures really are kind of beautiful. I think they are. And I got free books with the German publisher out of it. So I think, uh, you know, you have to stick to, if you're a musician and you are dedicated to your craft, no matter how hard it is, you have to stick to it. You got to put yourself out there. Um, a lot of things right now, and most certainly because of um, the pandemic, a lot of things are do it yourself, DIY, make your record, have your best friend uh, 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 film your best song on your record. You know, I don't know anything about perfection. Perfection is clinical to me. Everything is all about feeling to me. So you make your record, you make your stickers, you make your uh, uh, merch, your t-shirts, etc., your cassettes, even cassettes are coming back a little bit. And you go out there and you, you, you just um, attack social media. You know, with photography, you find out what it is that you wanna do. Uh, you know, my thing for those three books were men. Now, I just love taking my camera everywhere. I'm big on shooting flowers and I'm still shooting portraits of people. I knew at some point, after four months of being stuck in the house and I didn't wanna be here anymore, I went out, I keep my social distancing, I wear my mask, I don't wear my jockstrap mask out there, but I wear a mask, a face covering, and you gotta still do that. Anyway, you just gotta follow your heart. And eventually, what you want to happen will happen. It won't, may not happen 100%, but a version of that might happen. And maybe that's all you needed anyway. So, I don't know, I think I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Sure. I, I, I can... You mentioned this on on Thursday. <laughs> yes. Bob Singerman uh, was on the line. Um, you mentioned a one man show, and sure. oh my goodness, I can see, I I I'm seeing this now with um, <clears throat> an orchestra. At some point, there has to be a bathtub with bubbles. Um, I, I, I think this is, this is coming together. Listen, uh, Martin, I would be so grateful. I'd love to do a one-man show. I know I sent you a little s private snippet where I said, spotlight, a little itty-bitty Panasonic 45 record player. Uh, you're playing either Respect by Aretha or Ooh Ooh Child by the Five Stair Steps, and then I walk out and I start telling my stories. <laughs> well, and the, the Listen. It's not beyond the realm of possibilities because I live in possibilities. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, uh, you seem really happy. I, I, people are, there's all kinds of comments throughout this. Like uh, people uh, get your energy. It's so positive. I, I've got to ask you, I, just, is, this a, a, is there an audio version of the book? Not yet. Uh, I got you know, you know, it's so wild, Martin, and you know this better than anybody or, or maybe anybody else who is a panelist or an attendee. Um, hi, record companies and book companies are alike. They don't do a lot for you. You know, they do stuff for you. It comes out. And, you know, I got to tell you, after this came out in March and the pandemic happened, and I, um, I got a good amount of press because we hired an independent, but after three months, they were done, there was no more money. So, like I said to everybody out there, I got on every social media, excuse me, every social media platform, all my friends who have podcasts, I said yes to, whatever q and A. I I did it. What was your question? <laughs> my question was, is there an audio version? Oh, not yet, but I'm gonna talk those suckers into making it. If not, I'll have to make it myself. Yeah, I, you know, so I, my my first book did pretty well, Tour Smart. Uh -huh. uh, I did that myself, Punk Rock. I loaded, I put 300, I mean, my book's huge. I put 300 books in the van, went all over the place, loaded it. If I saw a tour bus, I'd knock on the door of the tour bus. Absolutely. I'd give them a, a here's this book, you know, get back in my vehicle, and eventually signed a deal. It, the book did so well, and... Uh, I ended up buying all the rights back to my books because I was, I was uh, 
unable to do the things I wanted to do with it, uh, like give it away, for instance. Right. If I give my book away, it's four dollars. If I give their book away, it's twelve. Yes, sir. So, and you know, on that tip, and not to interrupt you, but I think it's going where you're going. And somebody here asked um, about the movie in the chat. So listen, my movie, Who the Fuck Is That Guy? The Fabulous Journey of Michael Alago had a three-year run on Netflix. It's over. We are the same thing with Amazon Prime. I think the only place you could see the doc right now is if you go to Amazon, and I think you could purchase the doc or you could rent it. The beauty is we just read the fine print of our contract that if something happened with the, with the, you know, the licensees, they, they filed chapter 11. And in one of those little bits of fine print, we got our movie back. Now, if that wasn't the case, they would have had the movie for 20 years. But what a blessing, Martin, that we got our rights back. So we're looking to, to um, relaunch it again. We're gonna add a, um, an epilogue Michael Alago, 2021, and from 2007 to 2021, 2017 to 2021, people are going to know what I've been up to, including the book, books, and just my crazy, wonderful life. I, I don't know if you saw the message from Laura Ledford. What? Why? Well, Laura Ledford is the dean of the College of Fine Arts at Millican University. Oh and yes, she said something. Oh hi. Uh, is that Laura where it's scrolling away here? This is definitely a one-man show. I have a nice little theater. It's actually a $26 million building that they just opened. Beautiful. And you can workshop it at Millican. Oh, wow. That, that could uh, make me cry. And um, that makes me feel grateful. And um, whatever you say. I'll, I, you know, you tell me, I'll show up, let's do it. That's, that sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's, that's a good place to end this day. Okay. Um, I, it's, I really love talking to you, Michael. Thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Um, what? Oh, this, well, there's, there's, there is one more smell. Oh, Lord have mercy. Uh, well, anyway, somebody on the right, I'm sorry, Martin, once again, I'm hijacking you. Somebody said you can't find the doc. You know, I think you could rent it on YouTube. I think you could rent it on Amazon.com or you could buy the DVD. Now, um, like I said, it's down for like a month or so, um, but it'll be back up when we get our new deal in the new year. So everybody keep following me on Facebook and on Instagram, Michael Anthony Alago, and uh, you'll know exactly what I'm doing in regards to the book and the documentary. So Mason, who, who put all of the, uh, the pre-rolls together for us, by the way, he just put the link to the DVD on Amazon. Oh, okay. And then here's a Thank question. Thank you, Mason. Uh, uh, it's, it's one of our students. Um, Pam Schwetz asked, uh, I noticed Cherry Vanilla was a big part of the rockumentary on Thursday. Yes. I want to know some old friends of mine, David Lur and Lenny Prusak. David used to manage her for a while and they are good friends. Ah, yes, that's right. I don't know them, but I remember hearing those names back in the day. Are they still with us? I, I, I don't know. Is Pam still around? Oh, yes. Oh, thank God for that. I mean, you know, you have, and it's not to be rude, Pam, as you probably know, but you got to ask these questions these days, like when you know people were around in the 80s and then you got to go, haven't seen them in a while. Are they with us? And it's always, you know, it warms my heart when you could just, just say yes. <laughs> um, they has the Jane Dean Gallery in Fairmount, Indiana, uh, says Pam. There we go. We could do the photo exhibit there. Oh, that'd be really cool. My black and white stuff is kind of great. Yeah. So wait, um, so is it Dave or Pam? You got to write to me so that I know how to reach all of you when this is over. And I'm easy to reach on Instagram and on Facebook. And there's Robert Singerman. Thanks again. He just got the book in the mail. Looking forward to reading it. Oh, hi, Bob. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And Thank you. I don't know if you know Ted Cohen. Um, no, who's Ted Cohen? Ted, oh my goodness, who isn't Ted Cohen? He was actually- Oh, Ted Cohen, who did the Bob Dylan book? Oh, I don't know. 
Forget it. Tell me who Ted Cohen is. Ted was the Warner Brothers rep on the first PIL tour. Oh. Uh, previously, he Tom worked with the Sex Pistols, the Beach Boys. Oh my God. And is still uh, he has Tag Strategic is his company. Uh, we, we've been talking about mentors and mentees all day. I would consider um, Ted a mentor of mine. Uh, oh, lovely. Um, and it's great to see him on this. Uh, great to see him on the session. Been here all day. Uh, and Ted's been here all day, yeah. Um, cool. Says he loves me. I don't know if he loves me or he loves you, Michael. Um, maybe he loves both of us. Oh, he says he loves Molly. Okay. He loves so who, Molly? He loves more. Fine. I want to finish this day okay. uh, with, a, with a way for us to, to remember. I want, I want to tell a story. Oh. Connected please. to it well. um, And then are we sniffing away again? Huh? Are we sniffing away again? We're going to sniff. But, but I want you to wait on the sniff. I want to wait on the sniff. Uh, let me see if I've got the, do I even have the, I've got the number in. Okay. So I want to tell a story. Um, <laughs> it's about my band, Brian Brain and Smells. Little punk, it's a little punk band. There was three of us. And hey, Brian, uh, um, there's Brian Justison. Um, three of us in the band and we were post-punk. I think I started the band in 1980, just as I was a joint pill. And we put my drums on reel-to-reel -reel tape. I think Soft Cell did the same thing. They had all their backing. It was great to watch the reels go round. It was Boy. like third member of the band. <clears throat> my drums were on tape. And instead of waiting for the audience to grant us permission to do an encore, I said, in a punk fashion, fuck them. Not only are we not going to wait for an encore, we put all the applause on the tape as well as my drums. Oh, that's great. So even if there was only three people in New Orleans, which there was once, we always got an encore. And even though somebody put a gun on the bar, we came out, did an encore, and I started crying because I couldn't believe the reception. This guy was really upset. Anyway, at our first show in England, I thought, not only are we going to put the applause on the tape, and we're not going to wait for the audience to grant us an encore. We're going to pelt them with bananas. But um, I wrote on those bananas by my single. I stayed up all night speeding. Um, oh my lord! By my single on about twenty pounds of bananas. Love it. And so we get to the end of the set, and I threw out what I thought would be treasured souvenir bananas and i just wrote be nice on this one okay I, right and that is as far as i thought this through and i think i was su as surprised as anyone when the first banana hit me in the side of the face ouch for the next five minutes I, we threw the bananas back the audience threw the bananas back at us we're scooping up handfuls of banana mush from the floor of the stage and I'm just splattering it on people. Pete Jones, the bass player, it's like the Keystone Cops. He's falling over, pulls his bass amp down on top of him, slithering around on banana skids. We got a pretty insane review in NME uh, from that night. A year later, <coughs> a year later, the owner of the record, the record label, Martin Hooker, um, who I had- his soul. M music for nations, right? Yeah, do you, know, do you know Martin Hooker? Yes, he had Metallica for the UK. Oh my goodness, you know, he passed recently. I just said that. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear you say it. You know, so he signed, he signed my band, Brian Brain. Wow. Secret Records, his first record label, and, the catalog number was SHH -H -H -O -O one And some people said, yeah, it was a secret. Nobody could find it anywhere. Oh, my God. So 
uh, Martin Hooker was at that show. And a year later, he was at a venue. And he said, Martin, I couldn't, for the life of me, I couldn't remember where I'd been in this venue before. So the scene at the end of this show, there's just handfuls of banana mush going backwards and forwards. It's going up into the ceiling fans and just going everywhere on the velvet curtains. We got paid a hundred pounds. The bill for the velvet curtains was 400 pounds to have them clean. Ouch. But a year later, Martin Hooker, rest in peace, is at a venue and he can't remember. I know I've been here before. The house lights go down, the stage lights go up and the room fills with the smell of bananas. So uh, in memory of Martin Hooker, everyone, let's scratch panel number one. Oh, but that doesn't mean it's peanut butter, does it? No, I just, I just <laughs> take oh. Oh. Is that like violets or something? <laughs> well, I hope it's banana. Oh, it is? I think so. I guess I, my sense of smell is bad. Do you know that when I was there at my height, when I was full blown AIDS and I was sick, if I smelled a banana, I would just vomit. I couldn't even smell a banana for the longest time. I hated them because um, it, it made that, me sick. Until today. Yeah. Well, this smells like a cross between a banana and those violet candies. Oh, Palma Violets. Is that what they're called? Palma Violets, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. little squares. So, so the idea now, Michael, is yeah. now everybody smelt that banana. If you smell banana again, you just, you'll feel inexplicably, you'll have to order Michael's book on Amazon, watch the video, sign up, buy one of my albums somewhere. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Now, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Is that all your merch behind you? Oh, uh, well, uh, slightly. There's the, um, uh, that's the shirt I wore on American Bandstand. Uh, oh, it's hard to see what it is, but okay. Here's some uh, scenery I made in 1994 for Pigface. This is the stay the fuck inside thing we did. There's my voodoo doll. Yes, but is, is pig face stay the fuck inside a t-shirt? Yeah, it's a t-shirt. Oh, I have, to, I have to get one of those. Oh, I'll send you some shit. I think I have about 500 t-shirts in my closet and I only wear the same 20, but we can add to that now. Brilliant. Oh, Tanya's wearing her shirt. Thanks, Tanya. Oh, oh thank you. Cool, looks great, fabulous. I have to get one. Uh, I'll I'll send you um I'll I'll send you a package of stuff, Michael. Um, Fabulous, thanks. Thank you so much for doing this Thursday and today. Um, I my, love my you pleasure. To come visit the 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 university when you can and continue this conversation with Laura. I would um, love that. Thank you so much. It, it will be uh, it will be really great. It's kind of a, a well. Now that you both put that in my head. Um, let's see, you know, as we move forward in this crazy world that we live in, um, when it's okay to start, ta well, for me, when I feel it's okay to start taking an airplane again, uh, we let all three of us please keep in touch about it. Um, if you're serious about it, I think you are, I'm serious about it. I think it could be really something having, um, talking about my life, showing clips of the movie, reading from the book showing my photography. So it really could be, and if it's a nice, small, intimate space, it really could work out beautifully, you know? Uh, absolutely. Uh, plus, there's like so many horn, string players, percussion ensemble. You can okay. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that, but since you say so. <laughs> yeah. So now wait. Are you, are you, do you think I'm leaving all of you and you're going to continue sniffing without me? No, this is the, this is the end. Oh, my Lord. The, we've been going for eight hours straight. Oh, so you've been sniffing without me? Yes. Oh, okay, fine. Anyway, 
Thank, Martin, thank you so much for having me. I completely adore you. I'm so grateful that we're back in touch with each other. Call me anytime, whether it's about health or music or everything and anything. And um, thank you, everybody. The 50 participants, the 14 panelists, the 36 attendees. You know, if you want to find me, I'm at Michael Anthony Alago on Facebook and the same thing on Instagram. And I'm there every single darn day. And um, I love doing these, uh, these Zooms, you know, just when we thought, you know, we were stuck in the house, you know, uh, we get to do Zoom with all of us, you know, yeah. each other. So yeah. thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, students. Thanks to Laura. Thanks to Milliken for being so supportive of awesome. all. Thank you. See you, everyone. Be safe. Bye, and Taya. Bye, Molly. Bye, Dora. Bye, Mark. Wait, wait, wait. Aren't there more people here? Hold on. Where's my little uh... Alyssa, Abby, Nate? Ma is it Matthias, Sammy, Mary Alice? Uh, Mary oh, that's it. That's all of us. Oh, and I guess May, uh, Mason is feeling very Orson Welles tonight. So we'll summon up the ghost of Orson Welles. And, uh, be nice, everybody. That's right. And maybe there's an Orson Welles movie on TCM tonight. Thank you. See y'all. Big kiss. Big hug. Virtual. Good night. <laughs>